And then I asked myself the right question. I said, are you going to give up to this or are you going to get up? And I thought back to how that's the whole purpose in what we do, is we learn to get up and we learn to move on. Hello, it's time for another episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Wrenchy Lisa Magira as we bring you episode 128. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the very first time. Today, we're featuring our shin guards, double layered for protection, ventilated for comfort, and easy to clean. You can find them at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, including links to everything we talk about today with Wrenchy Lisa, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, why not? We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. Wrenchy Lisa Magira occupies an interesting place in the martial arts world, at least for listeners to this show. Over the episodes, we've spoken of various guests in a familial sense, as they tie to my place in the martial arts world. We've heard from older siblings, uncles, and some others. Wrenchy Lisa Magira is best described as my sister. Just a short time after I left Maine for college, Wrenchy moved to the area and started training at the karate school I grew up in. She ultimately took over and continues to operate it today. She learned the same things from the same people I did, and because of that, we have a lot in common. Interestingly, we had very little overlap as my college visits to home didn't really involve martial arts. I was there for holidays and weekends. But since then, we've built a strong friendship over the last few years, and I've really enjoyed getting to know her and spending some time with her and going back to visit. This episode is a lot of fun for both of us, and hopefully you enjoy it too. Wrenchy Lisa, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me on today. Hey, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. And unlike a lot of the guests that have been on the show, I know you. I know. So that's kind of fun. But at the same time, there's a lot that I don't know. You know, there, there, in some ways, like, I, I feel like I really know who you are because we have even beyond similar lineage, almost the same in, in many respects. But then there's a whole other part of who you are as a person that I don't know. So I'm looking forward to this personally and maybe a little selfishly. Well, that's good. I am too. I, we do share a lot in common and it'll be fun discovering those things as we go through the conversation. Yeah. So let's get started. Same way we always start, kind of a, a, a boring question, but such an important one and, and one that always spiders off into great things. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I didn't start training until I was 25 years old. I had always been an athlete, you know, in school, soccer, basketball, all those kinds of team sports, and nothing ever really stuck for me. Uh, and then I was living in the Albany area. I was living in Gilderland. And uh, an EMT friend of mine turned to me one day and she said, hey, I took an Aikido class the other day. Um, I think you'd really like it. The first class is free. And uh, do you think you'd want to try it? And I said, sure. And uh, so probably within a week or so, I went to the uh, Del Mar School of Aikido with Rick uh, Wallslayer and completely fell in love just with the movement, with everything that we were doing. You know, I don't remember what it was we did in our first class, but I remember, you know, like walking in in the hallway, the shoes in the hallway, and people caring for their geese, you know, folding their geese and tying them up and and uh, the kids' class ending and then entering into the adult class on the canvas mat. And that whole kind of process and the ritual of it. And I didn't have anything like that um, in my life at the time. My life was, you know, I was in my 20s and I was working, I was single, I was I was just kind of floating, though. I had, I, you know, I'd moved away from my family. And all of a sudden, within a few short weeks, I discovered this environment that was like a new family. And um, 
and I, I was addicted. I was totally addicted from the very start. And one day, one day I showed up for class and I could barely move. We had been rolling and rolling and rolling the night before, and I had thrown my back out. Uh, but I woke up in the morning, and, you know, it was 10 o'clock. It was time for class. I said, okay, I'm going to class. <laughs> so I got there. I could I could barely even bow in, and the instructor looked at me kind of funny, like, you know, Lisa, are, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, because I'm, you know, struggling to get down to the mat. And uh, so we bowed in, and he invited me over to the, to the side of the mat, and you know, and as a school owner now, he was probably thinking, oh, God, I hope this person doesn't sue me for, you know, injuring them in my class. <laughs> uh, but, you know, at the time, I was thinking, wow, what a nice person. He's he's taking care of me. And he, he did, like, reflexology on my feet to try to alleviate my back pain and, you know, didn't help at all. But at the same time, it was this kind of – it was this new kind of respectful relationship uh, that I wasn't used to having in my life, and it completely hooked me. And – and drew me in, and I mean, I just went to every class that there there could be. So, so anyway, from there, I actually only went to that school for three months. Uh, my job moved me to Massachusetts, so I probably had a gap of a couple months in between. I tried to find an Aikido school. It was so traditional and so different than the kind of modern school I had seen in New York. Didn't fit into my schedule. Uh, ended up finding a Korean school. Loved it. Went every day, six days a week. Seven, on the seventh day, you know, on Sundays, I'd train up at the beach for a couple of hours. Um, and I was there for probably almost two years. And and then my life moved me to Maine. And so, which is actually where you come in, because I moved to Maine, I think a year after you moved out of Maine, and I found the yeah. school that I'm at now. So I found Bushido Karate Dojo in Casco, Maine, this little teeny tiny town. Uh, and these instructors who were just incredible, best martial arts I had ever seen. Um and and so that's how that's how I got to BKD anyway. So maybe that was you know a long start, but that's how that's how I ended up in Maine and where I am now. Wow. So what was it? You know, you said you you were an athlete, but I kind of got the sense you know you you hadn't found your thing. You know, and certainly knowing you now, martial arts is your thing. Mm, absolutely. What was it? Because I. I there, there's something I'm reading in between your words that you had a, a pretty good idea even early on with Aikido, which is not the style that you've stayed with, no. that there was something in there that was really resonating for you. Am, am I am I misreading that? No, or? no. I think I mean I've always been such a kinesthetic, physical, you know, person, and yet even within the sports that I found, as a soccer player, I was the goalie. On a diving team, I mean, on a swim team, I was a diver. You know, so I always kind of had that, you know, not quite right in the head position on the team, maybe. <laughs> mm. And and then I think I don't know. There's just something. Well, you you know, one thing that made me successful in martial arts was my ability to mimic movement. You know, I could be, I can be shown a technique and I can do it. You know, I can copy it. I can duplicate it. And so that allowed me. So then when you, when we talk about that as just a natural skill and then you place kata in front of somebody and now it's like this, this, you know, this physical information that you can consume and, and repeat and get benefit out of and become a more calm person. I think one of the things I learned in Massachusetts, I had a wicked temper. And all of a sudden, I had this place to put that physicality. I had a place to put, um, you know, I could hit something and feel better and not hurt somebody in the process. I think my temper was more, you know, useful for destroying relationships than, uh, than being directed somewhere. So for me, when I came across this environment where I could roll or punch or kick or you know hit sticks with somebody all of a sudden it was this oh my gosh this is okay for me to do and it's maybe a little not right in the head but it <laughs> feels good i'm not in trouble and i can be really great at this and uh and i did i just i just more and more and more and more i just wanted as much as people would give me yeah and you jumped in with with both feet and of course that you know you've you've been stuck in that cement so to speak for all this time. I think so. I know. Go ahead. Well, and then when I moved to Maine, there was a there was a point where I was doing some goal setting, and I I had at my school in Massachusetts, I had trained you know, fourteen sixteen hours a week, consistently, 
And then I, I was only training four hours a week because, you know, we only had classes a couple nights a week. And so I wrote on my goals, I want to train 15 hours a week. And within seven days, I was teaching. <laughs> Beth had me, te- you know, let's say Beth had me teaching all these numerous classes for her all of a sudden. And so I, I was able to jump in and it was, you know, when you don't define your goals clearly enough, sometimes, you know, the world pushes you in a direction that you don't expect. And so, you know, in my head, I was thinking personal training time, but then I, I got into a place where now I was teaching. I love to teach it. And it then, within a short period of time, the practice of teaching really took over for me just as much as the practice of doing the arts myself. Mm. One of the quotes that comes up for me, and this doesn't come from the martial arts, at least not the way I heard it, but if you don't live your life the way you want to, you'll live it the way someone else wants you to. Mm. And goal setting is such a, a big piece of helping define what you want. And it's something that I've implemented and has been part of the success of Whistlekick. I, I can't put it any lighter than that. I mean, it truly has been one of the driving forces. And isn't that what's great about like the rank system is you have a natural goal system in place for people. They say, well, what do mm-hmm. I have to do to get to this rank? You say, well, you need to learn these two katas. You need to be able to do, you need to be able to combine your techniques. You need to be able to spar at a proficient level. And when you get there, we'll have a conversation and then we'll test you. And, and oh, well, what do I need to do to get to the next rank? And so even, even through that process as a teacher, I've kind of developed you know, and watching students, when you watch thousands of people go through the ranks, you start seeing the similarities in what it takes to become a master, in what it takes to become a black belt, in what it takes, oh, those, you know, that, those blue belt blues, those kids are going through it, they're, they're stuck in this place. Well, why are they stuck? Well, because they have to be creative and, and discover that something works for them before they can move to the next stage. And, um, and so, yeah, goal setting is so important. Um, regardless of which side you're on it as a student or even as a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Now, I know you've got stories. I've heard a lot of your stories and we'll probably tell some stories that I've heard and that's quite okay because the listeners, most of them haven't heard them, <laughs> but I'd like you to take a second and think about your best martial arts story and share that with us. Well, you know what? You were there. <laughs> you were there wow. this, okay. this past summer. This past summer, my favorite, my favorite place to go and thing to do was karate camp. Um, I think it's so important for people to immerse themselves in martial arts. And when you, whenever you have a chance to go and study for eight hours one day, you know, eat and sleep and hang out and, you know, with, with the people in your school overnight and then get up and train again the next day, I think there's nothing better. And um, you were um, wonderful enough to come to our karate camp this summer and be one of my guest instructors. And we had, who did we have? We had some kung fu people. We had a jiu-jitsu guy. We had Sensei Hal. Uh, we had um, a Kempo guy, right, Sensei Aaron. Then you were there, and you were kind of focusing on kicking and taekwondo. Uh, and then I had the karate piece. And what happened was we had had a full day the day before. And when we woke up in the morning, we went to the field, we did Tai Chi when the sun was coming up, and the instructors, we just kind of organically, we gathered in the, in the parking lot, and we were discussing what we wanted to do for the day, because I hadn't really overplanned it. I, didn't, I never know who's going to be here on the second day of karate camp anyway. And so we said, well, what if? What if we got everybody on the field? Um, and, you know, I really believe that sparring is the place where people confirm the lessons that they're learning. So... We got on the field and we said, all right, well, let's have all the instructors to kind of take a corner and we'll split the group up. I think we had maybe 36 people. I think it was 36 people in six groups. That's kind of my recollection. And so we had six six instructors and we had um, six groups and we would send the, the groups off to each corner and they would work with an instructor for like 20 minutes. Except for you. Every time I said, is everybody ready to get back together? You're like, I need five more minutes. <laughs> okay, we get five more minutes. Um, <laughs> and so, so we would work with our groups. And so you, what were you doing? Do you remember what you were doing? It was, it was all kicking drills, kicking and footwork. 
And I remember it was it was double kicks because when mm. we got because what we did was we would put give everybody that time. We come back together as a group, and Sensei Hal was doing rolling. You were doing double kicks. The sifus, the, the kung fu guys were doing flow. I was doing structure, right? And then um, since Aaron was doing, like, quick hands. So when we'd get back together, we'd do 25 minutes, and then we'd get back together as a group, and everybody would spar. And, you know, I'd go with somebody, and they'd kick me twice. They'd kick me in the head, and I'd be like, oh, you were working with Sensei Jeremy. You know? <laughs> and then I'd go with somebody else, and they'd, like, you know, they'd do this great, you know, throw. And, oh, you were working with Sensei Hal. So as a teacher, it was so great seeing everybody take that information and then immediately apply it because it to me it feels like it sticks for them and you know even though it's me in some ways it's not my story it's our story and to me those are the best stories because you're out there with a group of people doing something that in this day and age nobody else is doing you know not nobody but i think it's so unusual to find a group of people really interacting in the way that you have the opportunity to do when you're doing martial arts. Yeah, I, I would agree. And it really was a fantastic weekend. And there was some, some great stuff that came out of that weekend, you know, in the way that we implemented that structure. And, and I'm hoping that listeners, especially if you have the opportunity to have some say over the way classes are structured or any kind of weekend events in your organization are structured, that, you give this a shot, this kind of back and forth with, as you put it, the, the sparring to kind of cement it in to tie those concepts together because the the progress that I saw from some people was just mind-boggling in just such a short time, just a few hours. Mm. It was really pretty incredible. One of um, One of the mentors that I have comes from outside the martial arts world. Um, but he's the executive director of Rad Kids, which is a personal empowerment safety education um, course meant for kids 5 to 12 years old. And his name is Steve Daly. And so when you go through the instructor course with Mr. Steve, um, he talks about the, the way that people learn and the way that we teach in such a way that they learn better. And so the first thing is demonstration. The second thing is explanation, right? So we demonstrate a technique. We explain the application of it, right? Demonstration, explanation, repetition. Then we, we put some time into it. And then impact, you add something to hit or touch, right? And then dynamic impact, which is really free thinking. So we demonstrate it. We show them how to do it. We explain how to do it. We give them time doing it. And you see that in karate all the time, right? You see that in martial arts classes all the time. Left leg forward, right leg back, lift your leg, front kick, again, 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 again. But the front kick that's done in the air is nothing compared to a front kick that's done on a bag. And that is a great way to learn that repetition. But that front kick that's done on a bag isn't truly owned by the student until they're in a, a free-thinking, sparring situation, and they see the opening, and they're like, oh, now it's time for a front kick, and they make it work, and they make it happen. Then it's theirs. Then they own it. And you and I have talked before about, you know, a lot of times in martial arts classes, there's so much choreography and so much, in some ways, over-teaching. Sometimes to be the best teacher, I feel like we need to back up and step out of the way and let people apply it let them try what we've taught them and let them choose it to confirm it in their learning. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not to say that structure isn't important and not to say that the ceremony and the, I don't want to use the, the word militarism, but the, the regiment of organized classes isn't important because I, I believe oh, it is. Right. I believe it's transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know you feel the same, but yeah, there, there needs to be a space for, people to explore their own development. And let's be honest, not everyone has the confidence to prioritize doing that outside of class. Mm, true. Sort of to find some space within class to let people try things that don't work. Yeah. Well, and I think that um, I was actually, uh, I was listening to a, a Bruce Lee podcast the other day and it was talking about, um, 
refining technique. And we talk a lot about that, like in our leadership weekends, we talk about the fact that when you get to, like in my school, I feel like when you get to brown belt, the journey from brown belt to black belt, which is in our school, but usually about three years, right? It takes three years to get to brown belt and then another three years to get to black belt in our school. And yet that second half of the journey is all about refining. And I had never thought of it before like this, but I was listening to, to the, this Bruce Lee concept of refining isn't about um, adding it's about discovering what doesn't work and taking it away. So really stripping down the stuff that isn't effective for you in your technique and mm. then coming up with being left with the efficiency, the proper movement, you know, things like that. I just thought that was such a cool concept. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't know that I've ever thought of it in that way, but I would have to say I agree. Mm. That, that refinement, kind of a, a polishing. When you polish something, you're taking away some of the material. Right, right. And what you're what you're left with is generally smoother, more um, more beautiful. Mm. There's a beauty in simplicity, I think. And I think you see that when you you know when you watch somebody do a form and it's clean and crisp, and there's no extra like head bob or or you know up and down movement or you know, whatever it is our students do when they're doing all that extra stuff. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, right. so clean and crisp and just just left with what's supposed to be there. Absolutely. So obviously martial arts is at the, the heart of your life and what you do and, you know, combined with your family and your whole family's tied into martial arts and everything. But what outside of martial arts kind of keeps you going. Do you, do you have hobbies? Do you have pursuits beyond Are there your other training things and your outside teaching? of martial arts? <laughs> yeah. I, I've heard that there are. I, I don't know. I don't know. know what they are. <laughs> you know, I'm so lucky for me, uh, you know, my, the, the school that I came to, right, BKD, is it's now my house and the fitness center and the karate school. It's all in one building. So it surrounds me. And, you know, they're some people talk about this concept of separating your life from your work, and that's just not there for me. I mean, my identity and ev- everything about me is tied up in the martial arts, and I love that. I mean, I'm a teacher. My kids, like you said, I have two kids, 15, 13. They both are, you know, one's a junior black belt, one's a brown belt. They both teach with me. Uh, my husband is black belt. He, we're, all, we're all teaching together, doing together. And 99% of the time when we do an activity, if we go to a baseball game, we bring the karate school with us. If we go, you know, if we go to Boston, we bring the, the teachers with us. We, so, so, you know, I guess family, family, I would have to say, is my other hobby. It's the thing I, will, I prioritize time for. Um, my dog is fantastic. She loves to catch a ball and rip apart a goose <laughs> with me. Uh, but, no, I, I, you know, for me, martial arts is just, it's really 99% of who I am and what I do. And you are certainly not the first person to answer that question in that way, right? Which is why we keep asking it to kind of reinforce that as you progressed, if you really want to be the best you can at at anything, whether it's martial arts or something else, you really have to dedicate your life to it. I mean, you rarely hear about someone who achieved tremendous success, someone who is world renowned for, for something and hear that you know, they work on it 30 minutes a week. Right, right. You know, that they, they train at it two hours a week and have for five years. No, it's something that they throw their whole mind, body, and soul into. I think and immersion is such a good word for it. You know, mm, and, it right, just, I and, and I think that it's not like I only stay in the dojo. If I go to, you know, church or the grocery store or, um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, my daughter and I, 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 my daughter gets her driver's permit today. And so, mm. so last week, as a parent, I had to go to uh, the last day of driver's ed, All right? And so I walk in, I walk past my daughter, and there's a couple of chairs in the back, so I sit in a chair, and I watched as a bunch of other parents came in after me, and not one kid stood up to, to let an adult sit down in their chair. And I thought, isn't that interesting, and isn't that horrible? And so I texted my daughter, because we both had our phones, and I said, you know, I said the kids should be standing up for the adults. And she tried, and nobody would take her seat. And then an opportunity arose for her to stand up 
and she off she said um you know she said mr so and so would you like my seat and he was clearly uncomfortable standing and he took her seat and she stood up and i was so proud of her in, in that moment and yet in the next moment i was horrified that five of the kids sitting down were giving her scathing looks for being polite and i thought wow my daughter takes the dojo out into the world with her and isn't that fantastic and how sad is it that we as a culture have gotten to the point where kids aren't standing up for grown-ups to sit down right and even more so their response to her doing something that most people i think would agree is the right thing yeah or if if not the right thing if you don't want to look at it in that way it's at least a polite thing it's a good thing hmm. And their response was negative. Yeah, and that that hurt me, you know. But and yet, on the other side, I was the parent, and I was pretty proud of her for for I was proud of her for being willing. And I think this comes from growing up in the dojo. I was proud of her for being willing to take those scornful looks and understand that she had taken the higher ground. You know mm-hmm. that it might not have been easy to do what she did, but she went to the higher place. One because I asked her to. Two because it was the right thing to do. Three because she knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. So I'd like you to kind of dig back a little bit and think about one of those times where life wasn't going the way that you wanted. You know, we're facing some kind of challenge, some obstacle, obstacles. And tell us how your martial arts training helped you move through that. Absolutely. I have a um it, and the, I guess the the story it starts out with with my husband. Um, my husband was a yellow belt the day that we bought Bushido Karate Dojo, and so within um, you know within a few years it was time for him to test for his black belt. And uh, there were two people. There were two people that tested that day for for their black belt, and. Um, the belt ceremony, well, you know, because you tested for your black belt in this school. Mm-hmm. I um, did. Near the end of the test, um, parents and family come in, and they sit kind of downstairs and wait for the test to be over. So his mother was sitting at the bottom of the stairs as he was um, engaged in the sparring portion of his test. Now, at the time, she doesn't realize that there's two people testing, so every time she hears a thud, <laughs> she thinks it's her son hitting the ground, as she tells it later on, you know. Um, but we were, we were sparring, and, you know, the black belts were doing takedowns on the people who were testing and, and whatnot. And so on the one hand, as, as a part of being a martial artist and, and being a teacher, I feel like we put obstacles in people's way, right, on purpose. And right. yet, every time he hit the ground, there was a chorus of, get up, get up, come on, come on, you can do it, get up. So there was support. Even though we, we were causing him to fall down, we were also encouraging him to get up. Um, and he, like I said, he tested with somebody else that day, and so they both, they both made it through. Um, and in fact, in that sparring portion, she broke her foot. Um, and then later decided that, you know, breaking a board with her broken foot was a better idea because she, could, she couldn't balance on the broken foot so long enough to break the board. So she kicked right. through the board with her broken foot so she wouldn't fail the test. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, of course, she didn't tell us. She didn't tell us that she had broken her foot. Otherwise, maybe we wouldn't have made her break her foot, break a, break a board with her foot, but... How funny. Anyway, you know, and something, I don't know, maybe only martial artists would laugh at that. We're a little bit, you know, crazy. Uh, so anyway, so, so, so the story kind of has to jump. It jumps maybe a few months from now, from there. And I'm driving down the road, and I, it's extraordinarily likely that I shouldn't have been driving because I'm, I'm crying. I'm crying about something. I'm just bawling my eyes out, probably money-related, who knows. And uh, so I'm crying, I'm crying, I'm crying, and I'm having this, like, kind of conversation with myself, and I'm thinking, this thing is so awful, this thing is so awful. I don't even remember, like I said, what it was. And I, and I thought, well, are you going to let it, like, are you going to let it keep you down? Are you going to are you gonna just lay down and, and take this situation? And, you know, I'm going through, and I'm still, still upset about it. And then I asked myself the right question. I said, all right, are you going to give up to this, or are you going to get up? I thought back to my husband's test, and I thought back to how, how that's the whole purpose in what we do, is we learn to get up and we learn to move on and we learn to see the next thing and we, we kind of dig down into that deeper self and from, find the survivor part in us 
and say, no, this thing's not going to beat me. I'm going to get up. We're going to find a solution, and we're going to move forward. Um, and so I think that was the real beginning of, of, a, of a much more resilient attitude um, in my life. Wow. And, I mean, that's, that's a pretty powerful realization, and it's one that I've heard a lot of people reflect back on their black belt test to talk about. You know, and it, it's something that we've heard about on this show quite a few times. And to be perfectly honest, it is what I have brought forward from my black belt test, my, for my first one, in that very dojo that you're talking about yeah. in your story, the notion that if I can make it through that, I can make it through anything. And we've heard that from so many people on this show about how martial arts extends out into life to just give you the the confidence to tackle whatever it is you want to tackle. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. So, um, did her foot heal? Okay. <laughs> Eventually. Okay. Eventually. <laughs> <sighs> now I'd like you to think about some of the people that you haven't had the chance to train with. You know, I mean, we, we both, we've talked at length about our, our respect for the, the people that founded the school that you now own. But obviously there are plenty of other martial artists out there in the world, uh, even though they are two of the best I've ever met. If you had the opportunity to train with anyone, whether they be alive or dead, who would that be? Well, I guess if I was going like, you know, toward the movies, I think those guys who uh, who choreograph the Jason Bourne uh, fight scenes are pretty cool. My my particular <laughs> favorite is like is the book to the throat move. You know, mm. that self defense, super accurate, <laughs> not super accurate, but just super useful <laughs> techniques. Right. Uh, and creativity with uh, whatever it is you have around you. So I guess maybe those those guys. Um, you know, or some of the you know some of the female martial artists that you see that you see today, you know, in different in different areas, um, things like that. I guess. Okay. Let's talk about competition. <laughs> and, and this is a, a question I genuinely don't have the the answer to. Have you spent time competing? We did. We we did a bunch of competing, probably only for a couple of years. Um, in the, you know how the, the age range, the, the ages, there's, there's an age group, right, that you compete with. And so I didn't start training until I was 25. Um, and my kids were little when, um, when we were doing competition. And so I think I was 32 or 33 or something like that, but when I was really active in competing. Um, and, which is a, it's a tricky thing, right? You go and I have a, had like a three-year-old and a one-year-old and Eric wasn't a black belt. So I was judging all day and, and then trying to compete in the afternoon. And, but it was fun because when I was at that was, when I was in that age group, there were eight or nine people in my ring. And then I turned, you know, either 34 or 35, whatever it was that put me into the next age group. And all of a sudden it was myself and one other black belt woman. And, I would beat her in kata, and she would beat me in sparring, and I would, you know, and so we went back and forth and back and forth, and so it became a little less rewarding in those days. Um, although maybe a few years ago, I did, I did go to one particular competition, and it was, uh, it was a great day. It was there was good fighting, there was good kata, um, but I don't do it as I certainly don't do it as much now as I used to when I was younger. Why were you competing? What was what was it about it that? I mean, because you did it more than once. You know, what was it that kept you coming back? Well, we were in the, you know, we entered the, we joined the smart circuit, you know, the main, whatever it is. I can't remember. You might probably know the acronym better than I do. Um, but we, you know, we joined a circuit. So there were points and this and that. And, um, but one of the benefits that I saw was sometimes you will train your forms and work your fighting more if you know there's like we talked about goals earlier if you know there's something coming up there's a competition or there's a test or there's a something um you'll work them and you'll get a lot better um 
and and whenever you leave your own school, right, when you spar with the same people all the time, you always know what to expect. When you go out into a competition, and, and again, this comes back to my comment of only having one person to compete against, when you go to a competition and you're fighting with different people, it makes you better because you're not, you can't anticipate everything they're going to do. You have to really rely on your skills uh, so, so much more um, in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. How about martial arts movies? I mean, you mentioned the Bourne movies, and you know you could make a a case for those being martial arts ish. At least the fight scenes are are pretty darn good. But do you have any favorite martial arts movies? You know, I guess I really like vampire movies <laughs> because they have such good hand to hand combat. So, mm. I mean, as far as a martial, if if I wanted to give you my favorite like epic traditional martial arts movie, it would be The Last Samurai. Because right? mm. the, 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 the concept of Bushido, and our name is, you know, our karate school is Bushido Karate Dojo, so, so it has this resonance, and there's, there are so many great kind of life lessons and good fighting and, you know, the concept of no mind and, and things like that. Um, so I guess I would say The Last Samurai is my favorite martial arts movie, probably closely followed by Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right, that one. Um, But, I mean, for modern movies, Underworld and Celine, completely, totally my favorites. (laughs) Great movies. They really are. They're they're fun. And, And the moment choreographers get the opportunity to suspend realism Mm -hmm. and start working with CGI and everything. Uh, I think that's why I love Crouching Tiger so much. It's one of my favorite movies, not just martial arts movies, but favorite movies overall, because it suspends reality in just such a way, right? That you can almost, you want to believe it can happen. You want it to be plausible. Yeah. 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 So when I see you running over the rooftop toward the dojo, then I'll know that (laughs) we've entered a new age. That's right. That's right. Coming coming across the uh, the nursing home roof right, there over the trees. <laughs> <laughs> How about actors? Is there anybody that really pops out for you? Whoever the woman is in Crouching Tiger, she was fantastic. You know, she's just strong <sighs> and and I mean not Michelle Yeoh. not older. Do you know what I mean? But I mean she's right. she's not a a young child either. You know, the woman who's who's the older older woman in the movie, and yet she's so flexible and so knowledgeable and so clearly a wonderful martial artist. Um, and, although my favorite scene is when they're, the two women are fighting with the weapons, and they take the camera and they bring it above, and you're looking down, and you can just really see the circular nature of what they're doing with their, you know, their Chinese-style fighting. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you mean do you mean Michelle Yeoh or do you mean I mean the older woman, not the, the younger. The, the, okay, the older one. Well, because there's kind of three in that first one. There's the young girl, right? Then there's, there's Michelle Yeoh, and then there's the the thieving older woman. You mean her? No, no, no. Well, there's there's the friend. I'm not going to do this well. See, I don't do names well. I don't do this kind of recollection thing well. Um, but so there's the main, the male main character, and then the mm-hmm. female who they're in love. But right. Her. Her. Okay, yeah, that that's Michelle Yeoh. Okay, yeah, her. <laughs> yeah, she's she's absolutely fantastic she and and if I remember she she's in her early to mid 50s now. Yeah. And just still, you know, still acting, still incredible, still, you know, a, a better martial artist than than the vast majority of us would ever dream to be. Mm. I mean, she's so incredible. And I love and I love watching female martial artists too because you know like my my husband might tell you you know the Fist of Legend might be one of those movies that we would go back to, um, and the Fist of Legend is such a brutal movie you know and bones cracking and all of that kind of stuff and but then you look at somebody like Michelle Yeoh and she's effective but there's such grace and beauty in what she does. And I think that's something that we female martial artists bring to the arts that I don't think it's underappreciated, but I think it's something to be appreciated. I, I agree. And actually, I don't know if it was that I've spoken about this with you or with someone else that 
there is a, a quality of grace that women, that females can bring to martial arts that very, very few men can. And, you know, I don't mean to be sexist in any way, but men have their strengths with the way they practice martial arts. Women have their strengths. And I think that grace is something that I particularly enjoy watching. Um, you know, there, there are some women I'm thinking of that I've seen in competition that just make my jaw drop, not because of their power necessarily, or not because of their speed necessarily, but because of the grace with which they execute everything. There's a presence that comes through with that. And I think that with some of the women that we see in movies like Michelle Yeoh, that comes through a bit. Well, and, and, it, and you and I have the same instructor, and we both know that She's one of the most powerful people I've ever met. And yet when you're smaller, you have to be more accurate and more technically proficient in order to, to, to gather every ounce of power that's in the, it's in the, you know, the kilograms and the pounds in your body. And, and she had that. And hopefully, you know, we emulate that as her students and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I just think, and I will tell you as an instructor, as a female instructor, as I was coming up and, and it's it's my own kind of personal experience that I would say only of 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 school owners, I would say only one in ten is a female karate school owners. I would say only one in ten of us is a female, and I know I really struggled with kind of balancing the masculinity part and the female part when I was first kind of in charge of my school because mm -hmm. I really tried to be more kind of macho than I need to be, than I try to be now. I'm just me. Um, but I was, you know, I was kind of more naturally nurturing in certain ways, and I didn't feel like that was being a benefit. But then when I tried to be hard, it was like maybe that wasn't the natural way for me. And I guess what I would say to other female martial artists is, or to anybody is you just have to embrace what's great about you and just not worry about the rest of it um, and not care what other people think. Because for me, I really gave away a lot of power in the beginning. I, I would think that I was being humble when I would go train maybe with other martial artists. And from the female perspective, I was feeling like I was humble, but from the male perspective, I was being perceived as weak. And so there's a lot of balance that has to go through that. You have to go through emotionally um, to come around, you know, to have strength and to be intelligent and to be in charge. Uh, and, you know, but hey, karate's karate. And when somebody walks in the door, I still feel like mm, they need to know that I could take them, <laughs> you know, because that's kind of my role, right, as the instructor. And it, as, as uh, you know, with my job is punching and kicking. I need to be able to punch and kick and I need to at least make you think that I'm better at it than you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And it, it's true. You know, one of the few criticisms that the show receives is that there aren't, uh, as some people see it, enough female guests. And it's not uh, anything intentional. There's certainly no exclusion of anyone based on gender. And I mean, I'm Pretty we just read a much smaller yeah, percentage. Yeah. The things that I've I've read say that fifty percent of people who try martial arts are, you know, male, female. But I don't know. I'm not A, I'm not sure if I believe that. Um and B, I know in my own school well, my school is different because I'm the I'm the instructor and I'm the head instructor and I'm I'm a female, so I probably have more female students than other schools. Mm. Uh, and oddly enough, my instructor was female. So what does that tell you, you know, about about how to come up in a school? Uh, but I mean, I would say that we probably females probably only represent twenty to thirty percent of an upper rank population. And then yeah. much, much less, you know, maybe 10% of, like I said, karate school owners or advanced ranked, um, you know, martial artists. You, you've got me thinking. When I think now about the women I know that own martial arts schools and the breakdown within them of students, I, there's definitely something there. Those schools that are operated by women have more women in them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's something I'm going to noodle on because I hadn't yeah, well, thought about because, it before. I mean, martial arts is, I mean, it's, you know, the, 
the balance, that fine line between violence and aggression and technique and sparring and all these different things that we do, it is not hard. And if you if you come from, you know, you and I come from the traditional world of if you hit me hard, I hit you harder. Well, and if that happens, then goodbye. <laughs> you, know, right. so, you know, a woman's going to feel like she's being abused and this is not for me. I don't need to go home with bruises on my arms and wear long sleeves because I have handprints from my Aikido class, you know. <laughs> I just wore the long sleeves. <laughs> so, ah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm not being abused. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> How about martial arts books? Are there any are there any books that you've read that really speak to you that you'd recommend to others? You know, I think um, you know, like I guess I've I've probably talked more about teaching than I have about my own martial arts kind of journey. And so for me, I'm always looking for how can I be a better teacher? How can I reach more people? And I came across a book called Teach Like a Pirate by Dave (laughs) (laughs) and it was such a vibrant you know wonderful little book about how to bring fun into a classroom and how to keep people engaged you know and so at like at our leadership workshops and things like that I'll I'll write on the board like if they're bored you're boring so you know if your students are bored you are boring and so we as instructors need to need to make it interesting and come up with new drills and not just have people stand in a line and throw punches and kicks and have them interact and and uh there's a great story that he tells in his book about having um it's either a box or like a phone booth and fitting as many many students as he could into the phone booth and by the end of the day, every class came in determined that they were going to fit more students into the phone booth, you know, and so this kind of competition came about because of it. So so it's not really a martial arts book. I Honestly, I think a lot of martial art, arts books are pretty crappy. You, you know, you, you, there, there's so much machismo and there's so much my style is better than your style or so much this is how you, you know, this is how you put your left foot forward and your right leg back. You know, there's so much kind of yeah. roll your fingers down, thumbs on the outside, you know, little drawings of people doing kata. Like, really? We're so much better than that. We need better books. <laughs> and there seems to be a, a, a crop starting to come out, you know, over the last five to ten years, some some better books coming through. And um, what are you, What's your favorite? Yeah. What have you read that you really like that you can that I can buy <laughs> and be impressed with. Well, um, one of the books I recently finished was from a guest that came on the show. Uh, Kyoshi Kevin Hudson was kind enough to send me a copy of his book called, um, oh shoot, it's called You Can Hit the Mark. And it, it's funny that I, I forgot that title initially. Initially, I, I apologize, Kyoshi. Um, I put but you it's on actually, spot. Who asked you, you did. Questions? You did. I know. I, I'm not used to being on, on this side. And actually, if you go, if anybody listens to episode 100, where I was on the other side, you can hear how completely out of sorts I am <laughs> being asked questions. And um, what you can't hear in there is the the extensive amount of time I agonized over what I was going to say prior to the episode. Uh, but in that book, he he just he tells stories. And I mean, we, we know from the show, I love stories. I love to hear stories. I love to to ask people about their stories. And that's what he does. He tells the story of his time in the martial arts and he uses it as a teaching tool to talk about lessons, the um, kind of the, the can't miss strategies that have come up for him from these stories. And the end of each chapter has, you know, one to three of these strategies that you can implement in your life. And it's, it's a uh, an easy read, but it's an entertaining read, and I chewed through it pretty quickly. And I'm not someone that reads fast or often. No, well, and I, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a book last year. Who knows what'll ever happen with it? And you read it. Um, I did. But I did write a book, and I tried to just keep it. I tried not to be preachy preachy, and I tried to keep it to just kind of stories that, you know, represented to me each belt rank stories that were wrapped around, you know. What is it? What do white belts go through? What do yellow belts go through? What are blue belts? You know, what are the emotion? What are the emotions wrapped up in being a particular belt rank? What are the actions that make you successful? What's the mindset of a black belt? And can you pick that up when you're a white belt? And does that make the journey easier? You know, so all 85 pages. (laughs) 
it's a good read and I, I I will put you on the spot I guess a little bit and say that I do hope that it does get published that people have the opportunity and when I, I'm not going to say if but when it does because I believe I believe you will find a, a path for it uh, we'll update the show notes and, and people will know how they can get a hold of it because it's a good book I enjoyed reading it well you know and I thought about I thought about making it into a series of blogs um you know, to put out. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I think what will end up happening is I'll have, uh, I'll have it digitized or whatever it is I'm going to do to, to make it just be for right now an ebook so that it's accessible to people if, if they should want to get to it. And then, uh, and then we'll print a few copies and see where it goes. <laughs> Sounds good. So we know you're goal oriented. We've talked about that a few times as we've chatted today. What are your goals for the future? What's keeping you going with respect to martial arts? Well, you know, I think, you know, last year, last the last few years, the last few years, it was almost as if I was trying to work myself out of the martial arts. I had all these kind of parallel backup plans in case my, you know, really my body wasn't going to make it. <laughs> you know, I had a series of injuries and, and things like that. And, and I thought, well, what, what, what's my backup? What's my backup? And, and I've really had not really one experience, but last year I spent a lot of time traveling and being away from my family and being away from my karate family. And I got to the end of it, and, uh, and part of it was a book competition. I was trying to get the book published and this and that, and I didn't win, and that's fine. Um, and what I came away wa- with was I said, why, oh, why am I trying so hard to impress people outside of my world? Why are they more important than the students that I have in my dojo that I'm leaving? I'm leaving these people who I care about to go be with people I don't care about. Why am I doing that? And so I came back from that whole experience and I thought, you know what, no more. I'm going to focus my time on my students, on my school, on, my, on our process, and Yes, someday there will be a, a change of hands with BKD. It'll change hands again someday. But I look at people like, um, oh, and you know, Sensei Mello. I look at I look mm-hmm. at schools like the Ica School, and Hanchi Almeida, and Sensei Mello, and or Shihan Mello. Uh, is that right? Is it Shihan? I think it is. It is Shihan, and uh, we'll we'll link in the show notes. And actually, good good place to mention for anybody that's new we put all these show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com shihan mello uh was actually uh, episode six right if right. i'm remembering correctly and so i look at these people who have schools and you know i talked earlier about the the kind of brown belt stage you know getting to brown belt and that here it's it's three years to brown belt and then three years to black belt and that brown belt's kind of this like mid-range point and um you know I've been a karate school owner for 12 years, and I have a, a few black belts. And, and we're more traditional. We take a little longer than, than maybe more traditional is not the right way to say it, but we take a long time to promote people. We don't do it quickly. Um, and it's not uncommon. Five or six years is not an uncommon length of time for somebody to get black belt. So in 12 years, we have a few black belts. We have, you know, three or four really amazing junior black belts. And I look at them and I think, wow, they could own their own karate school. Isn't that amazing? And so I sort of realized the other day, we're at a midpoint. I'm like a brown belt karate school owner because I look at somebody like Hanchi, Hanchi Almeida and, and that Ica school down in Massachusetts. And, and you look at their pictures and you look at the hundreds of people or, you know, the multiple 20 black belts and, and all these people in their school and multiple schools. And I think I want that. I want my kids to go out into the world and own their own karate schools and have the blessings that we've had doing, doing this. Because you, there's just something about being a martial arts instructor. You know, I had, a, I had a parent yesterday confess to me that her child had been assaulted. Her eight-year-old child had been sexually assaulted. And I thought, wow, you're entrusting my, me? Me. You're entrusting me with your child to help them build their self-confidence back and help them build themselves to a point where they're not scared anymore. 
we have an important job. And I don't want to look anywhere else anymore. I want to look right here in my home, in my town, with my 150 students. And if it grows, it grows. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I'm going to spend every minute with first my family, and they all happen to be martial artists, so that works out well for me. (laughs) First with my family, and then with my karate family, and everything else next. And so that 12 years from now, how exciting it will be to look back and see where we've come. I think there's something really special in the way that you presented that. The thing that resonated most for me was around your kind of redoubling of your focus of what you can really affect. And I don't want to say easily, but where your efforts are going to have the most return, as you said, in your community, in your town, in your school versus putting that effort out in book, into a book that certainly would be impactful to people. But is anyone going to be impacted reading that book the same way that even, let's say, three months of classes or a month of classes at your school will have on them? You know, and I, I would guess probably not. Uh, maybe a few people would, would have, see that book as life-altering. But I know for a fact that people that come through pretty much any martial arts school, and I I can speak specifically to your martial arts school, do have their lives altered for the better. And so to put the effort into that certainly makes a lot of sense. You're you're welcome. And I think it's, you know, even though we're talking about it, even though you said it, it's something that I think a lot of martial arts instructors do, and maybe they just don't realize that that's why it's so important to them. Well, yeah. And I think, you know, and sometimes I, you know, I, I, I think I represent maybe a different demographic of martial arts instructor, too, because, you know, we don't charge enough (laughs) at my school. And, you know, as an instructor, we struggle financially sometimes. And yet, at the end of the day, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't do anything else with my life. And, you know, we give scholarships to kids all the time because I would much rather have a kid in in my dojo and be safe for an hour than sometimes be where they might otherwise be. And, yeah. and yeah, I mean, we, you know, I have, this, I have this hashtag that I've been using for the last couple of years because I, I, I read the book um, by, uh, oh, this one's not by Malcolm Gladwell, but I love Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> um, because he's so much, I guess I realize he's so much a better writer than I am. And when you do <laughs> something that you're strong at, I'm really good at being in front of people. I'm really good at physically being in your space, you know, and that's where I shine. Malcolm Gladwell, he can do the writing. <laughs> but, sure. but Simon Sinek wrote the book, Start With Why. And so it got me really thinking, well, why? Why do I do karate? Why is this, you know, my thing? And I thought back to those, those days in my 20s when I was kind of lost. And I thought, well, karate made me a better person. And then I read a, a book about, uh, you know, vision, visioning, um, creating a vision or... The, what is it, vision mapping, I don't know, something like that. And, uh, and I thought, well, what do I want my school to do? What's, what's like our mission? What's our vision? What do we do? And so if karate made me a better person, then we make better people. That's our vision. <laughs> Hashtag make better people. Uh, you know, so I use it all the time, but because that to me is what we're supposed to do. And the money follows. You know, the, you know, you we were we you and I were talking the other day about you know how how are things? Because you know what, we have an emergency emergency fund. We're not dipping into it, and yet we're buying a furnace and paying the mortgage this week. Things are good. You know, right. you don't have to be you don't have to have thousands and thousands of dollars in the bank to be successful. And I think we have to be careful of how we measure our success. Um, and we shouldn't measure it in dollars. We should measure it in the the amount not even the amount, but the quality of the lives that we impact, you know, and who we impact and how we do that on a daily basis. We can create wealth and success in so, so many different ways. It's so poignant. Wow. Hard to follow that. Hard to, hard to even offer words um, to, to transition off of that. Because as we've talked through the episode, you've, you've gotten your groove. I agree. Right? I and totally I just, agree. And yeah, yeah. And um, some of the listeners know that as I talk to someone, I'm keeping notes. I'm keeping notes on quotes and, and things like that to make sure that the show notes later on be, become as, as 
solid as they can, and it helps me write the intros and the conclusions later. And I've run out of room. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's pretty cool. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you, um, you know, if they're passing through Maine and they want to train or, you know, they want to have you out to speak or they want to email you and beg you to release your book because <laughs> they've, they've found what you've said to be so wonderful, uh, how would they get a hold of you and and all that? Uh, the first way is, you know, we have a couple of websites, one uh, that's more around our, you know, karate school, and that is bkdfitness.com, Boy King David, or Bushido Karate Dojo and Fitness Center, so bkdfitness.com. Uh, and then we have another website that is wrenchylisa.com, R-E-N-S-H-I, wrenchylisa.com. Uh, and then that has, you know, different YouTube videos and things like that that we've done. And anything we've done is really targeted toward our own students, you know, something that can help them be successful in, in what we do here. Um, they can reach me on Facebook, Lisa McGuera. Uh They can reach me on Twitter, Wrenchy Lisa. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be out there in all those different ways. But uh, right. any of the websites would give them uh, kind of... Uh, contact information oh i guess so the final one would be bkd fitness at gmail okay and of course we'll link all those on the show notes right uh, which again uh whistlekick martial arts radio.com sorry i was just jotting those notes make sure i had everything together and trying to find a, a space on the paper to write that legibly uh, that was oh. that was the challenge that took me away for a moment <laughs> but i want to i want to say something to you or for sure. you and i want to let you know how proud i am of you for everything that you've accomplished um i'm not sure that we made it completely clear uh but when you were a little kid you started here at bkd as one of the very first martial artists to enter enter the doors uh, you left in 97. I arrived in Maine. You got your black belt, went off to college, um, and I arrived in Maine the year after. I came back. You came back once. I saw you do some capoeira during your college days, and, uh, and then we didn't see each other for a long time. And, uh, yeah. and I just want you to know that I have enjoyed watching Whistle Kick become successful and profitable finally, uh, and I've enjoyed... Um, Seeing the drive that you have and uh, watching you with students and creating a community of people. I just think that you've really done so many, so many wonderful things in the martial arts world. And, and I hope that, and I know that you will, you know, keep striving and keep driving and keep having great ideas. And also, I think you're very good at um, waiting and waiting until you're ready for something. And so I just wanted to make sure that you got a compliment in all of this because it's so fun working with you and seeing you succeed. Well, thank you. Um, wasn't expecting that, and and so feeling a little a little unsettled. I don't take compliments well, but I, it's something that I'm working on. So thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. And uh, no, listeners, that was not the cost of admission. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, and I really appreciate you and it's, it's been fun, you know, kind of reintegrating and, and quote unquote coming home in a sense and, and, and just seeing all the wonderful things that our collaborations have and, and will ultimately lead to. So that's fantastic. But as we wind down here, uh, we always like to go out on a high note. Not that this hasn't been a, an incredible episode, but do you have any advice for the people that are listening? You know, I think my one pet peeve about martial artists is when I meet somebody and they say, I was, uh, or, or they say, I am a martial artist and I trained, you know, I was training in my 20s or something like that. They, you know, they speak in the present tense, but then they talk about them, but they haven't trained in seven years. And I think that a true, you know, to me, a true martial artist keeps training and, uh, you know, I tell my kids, I told, I told some karate kids yesterday, I said, I said, you know what the secret to becoming black belt is? And they said, what? And I said, just keep coming. Just keep coming. Just keep training. When we give out stripes in our class, I say, this is a black belt moment. You just had a black belt moment. And if, if you can come to five or 6,000 classes <laughs> and have a black belt moment every single time, learn one thing change one thing 
get rid of one thing, um, become a little bit better, a little bit at a time, and then be patient enough to give yourself the space and time to get where you want to go, then you will become a black belt or a master of whatever it is you do. So I don't believe in past tense. Keep training, stay in the dojo, find a new dojo if yours isn't working for you, and, but just stay the path. Stay the path, and, and the rewards don't end, regardless of what side you're on. The rewards don't end, and, and uh, so stay with it. That is my advice. I've always found Renchi Lisa to be such a positive person, and it's hard not to feel inspired when you hear her speak. I always come away from our talks with a sense of clarity when it comes to my purpose in the world. Hopefully, you found some of that too. Thank you, Renchi Lisa, for your time. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes, including photos with Renchi, as well as a place to sign up for the newsletter, other great episodes, and some links to the things that we spoke about today. You can follow Whistlekick on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username is, boringly enough, Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our sort of secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We've seen a number of you joining that over the last few weeks, and that's great because it adds to the conversation and gives us some ability to poke you and see what you want out of the show. We're always open to new guests, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring or maybe make a suggestion of somebody you know, your instructor, somebody else, we want to hear from you. Head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, fill out the form. If you have any other feedback, we would love to hear it. And you can do that on the website too. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing so you don't miss out. And you know we're always asking for those reviews and keep them coming. We, we appreciate the ones that have come in. And we're in a little bit of a lull right now. So if you haven't, please take a couple minutes, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and give us a review. iTunes is the one that most people seem to be using. So why don't you head there? Even if you don't use an Apple device, you can still leave a review. Remember everything we make here at Whistlekick, like our great shin guards. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com for our exclusive wholesale program. That's all for today. Until next time, you know how it goes. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.